I'm Bill Gaventa. It's my advantage and that I get to do my presentation after having a chance to listen to everybody else's presentations. This was the talk I would have done if I had been present at the Institute, but afterwards it now gives me a chance to kind of look back and use this presentation um, to kind of draw a bridge between the the focus on practical ministries on Monday of the Institute and then on theological inquiries and studies um, during the rest of the week. So I'm looking at what of how we rediscover the old and the new and some of the biblical themes emerging in inclusive ministries. If you ask a family or a disabled person or an adult with a disabled member or an adult with disability to tell me your church stories and you are trusted, the response is rarely lukewarm. Some will tell you about how important their faith has been to them or congregation. Others will tell you how painful and wounding their experiences have been. That's why trust is so important, because responding truthfully about an issue around which there are such powerful feelings and beliefs and experiences is not an easy thing to do. You may be walking on holy or sometimes what feels like hellish ground. But in listening to those stories in the past few years, I think we're at a new point in the development of inclusive congregational and religious supports. The new era has many promising signs, but also some dangerous ones. It's a time when families and people with disabilities and leaders in congregations are also beginning to interpret their experience through sacred scriptures, symbols, and traditions of their respective faiths. That's a crucial step, for it means that people who are advocating and working for more inclusive congregations can understand their experience as living out ancient understandings of their faith, not something that's just brand new, including accepting and celebrating the gifts of everyone and the diversity of humankind is a response that represents, <clears throat> excuse me, the best of our traditions and beliefs. So what are some of those signs? Here's some word pictures and word snapshots um, and, and vignettes that have come my way. Many services for kids with disabilities started in church basements. Most of those have moved up and out now and have and are full-fledged service systems in the community. But, con but in congregations, there's a new focus on accessible spaces, altars, and even pulpits that change their height to fit the person behind it. It's not just the pe person in the wheelchair who benefits from all those accessible spaces. The written resources and audiovisual resources for congregational ministries have multiplied many times over. With good resources for religious education, like Eric Carter's wonderful book, Outreach and Worship, and new ones in theology, pastoral care, and seminary education. Some of those new ones include real res new resources for people with autism, about their faith and their spirituality, and also ones on grief and loss for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Some congregations are attributing their growth to their outreach to and their inclusion of people with disabilities and their families, while they even more quickly celebrate the renewal of spirit that that inclusion has brought to their congregational life together. Congregations and religious services are making the connections between supports for people with disabilities and those who are elderly, as just as John Swinton's done in this institute. Respite care is no longer a foreign word. Everybody needs a Sabbath, a time for renewal, where we can recharge spirit and energy to go back to the task of caregiving and support. When a diocesan task force on accessibility brings a resolution to an annual conference that by a certain date every congregation should be accessible, or if not, congregations should take down the everyone's welcome sign on their front lawn, you know that a new era is happening. That didn't pass, but it sure got people talking and thinking and working. 
as well as pledging that all diocesan meetings would be in accessible spaces. A parent leaves a, leads a presentation to future priests and clergy about the importance of inclusion of children with disabilities in parochial schools and in religious education, and says to them, if you're not prepared to support the inclusion of my child in the parochial school at all levels, then that's a violation of the baptismal promise. Or stated more forcefully, if you're not to prepared to support their inclusion, then don't baptize them. Other parents of children with disabilities report stories of moving to a new community and going church or synagogue shopping and doing and as or doing so as they decide to try again within their own community and they find a congregation where the welcome mat is out the supports are in place people simply come up to them and say what do you need and what do you want for your child or our family member some parents are so used to having to fight for inclusion or are prepared to uh, expect a uh, uh, lack of interest or outright rejection, that they don't, they're not sure what to do. It's just an experience of pure grace, as these families have talked to me. Many faith groups have talked about, have now developed uh, resolutions and policy statements, not just by individual churches, but by denominations and ecumenical groups like the National Council of Churches, uh, councils of churches in various states, and the U.S. Catholic bishops. Other statements and policies have been about the right to religious expression and spiritual supports have been developed by national advocacy and professional organizations, such as the ARC and the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. The Association of Theological Schools has a new policy on disability uh, for seminaries across the country. The variety of networks around religious supports for and to and with people with disabilities and their families are growing, both in North America and internationally. Some of those are local, metropolitan, some statewide, and some national or international um, para-ministry organizations and others or that both work within particular parts of faith spectrums or ecumenically and on interfaith bases. And faith supports and religious inclusion, religion and disability is also beginning to attract researchers from both within faith traditions and from the perspectives of social and health sciences. This conference represents in some ways the new wave of books and writers thinking about the intersections of theology and disability from various theological disciplines. But there are also researchers within uh, health and human services that are taking a look at spirituality and faith for and with people with disabilities and what support agencies can do to support that important dimension of people's lives and community inclusion. You may have your own stories, but there are also cautionary stories and warning signs. They're not all good. Some continue to haunt me. A mom came up to me and told a story, or a mother, she wrote an email after a column that I wrote in the ARC newsletter, Insight, and she had taken her son with autism to worship after lots of practice at her home to help him become familiar with the patterns of the service. His noises became problematic, and the deacons asked her to leave, to the, go to the back of the sanctuary. That still continued, and she went out into the lobby where he still continued to make some noises. And a deacon came out and said, we need you to leave because of the disturbance or the disruption. And she did so uh, with tears. And then later on realized that the sounds that he was making, her son was making, were, were, not, were following or mimicking the the pattern of the litany and the words being spoken from the pulpit and the irony was that the scripture for the day and that and the lesson was on welcoming the stranger and all the children coming to me 
Many congregations have not yet begun to address the possibilities of inclusive ministries and faith supports, nor have professionals and service organizations. That inertia and reluctance is shaped by a number of issues and barriers. One of them is the equation of faith with reason. We know that the capacity to love does not depend upon reason or IQ, neither does hope. But sometimes faith still gets linked to intelligence and the capacity to understand the more abstract parts of faith and religion, religious tradition. We also know that there continue to be ongoing stories of spiritual neglect, or one might say spiritual abuse. Stories when you ask families and individuals with disabilities who will tell you one of two things, they fit into two categories. One, the eternal question of what did you do that God sent you this child? Whose fault was it? Or secondly, on the other hand, if your faith was strong enough, someone could be cured or you could be cured. And because of those stories, I think that's one of the reasons of the polarization between scientific or human services and faith services that lead to people in human services being very leery about religion and spirituality, both out of the certainty that they're not supposed to proselytize if they're funded by public sources, but also because they're, they know that these are powerful and sometimes negative experiences for families. Some, sometimes people use church-state separation to justify the avoidance of those kinds of issues. But those stories and the wounding that happens with them uh, impacts numbers of people, not just the families, the individuals, and their extended families, but also staff who work with families and individuals and many others. Conversely, the stories of inclusion also spread out as people with as disabilities in their families tell others about what their congregations are doing and how wonderfully they're being included in their faith community. But finally and more ominously, there are ways in which children and adults with disabilities become the canary birds of the ethical dilemmas in health care in our time. People around whom the ethical questions of treatment and resources get raised because of the assumptions and judgments that are made about their quality of life. You know, canary birds were often sent into a mine with the miners to see if the atmosphere was clear of poisonous gases or if they slumped over in their cage, it was an early warning system that this atmosphere, this place was dangerous and we need to be really careful here. Hans Reinders is without peer, I think, in exploring some of the ethical questions that are raised by disabilities in human services and health care. But these are issues that are not just about them, but about all of us. Those issues and barriers, the negative stories that many individuals and families may still have as they search for a congregational home, should not, though, keep us from celebrating what's happening. To use biblical imagery that's familiar to both Christians and Jews, in what I sometimes call the first sermon on accessibility in the Bible, there are indeed, quote, ways being made straight in places that have been deserts, Valleys being exalted, <clears throat> mountains and hills being made low, crooked ways straight, and the rough plains smooth, or, to say it another way, accessible pathways and journeys, both into a congregation for people with disabilities and into a life of faith. So let's reframe this journey. There are at least three implications for this growing number of positive stories. First, it's crucial that the new examples and stories be told and celebrated, for they inspire others to action and inspire imagination and help inclusive ministries become the norm rather than the exception. Second, the next significant wave of inclusive ministries and supports will come when individuals and families, younger people and including people who've been excluded in the past, have the courage, the forgiveness, and the chutzpah to try again and to do so with a commitment that they should not have to justify their inclusion in a faith community, 
but they have the right to belong just as much as anyone else. Elizabeth Hastings, a disability advocate and writer about theology and disability in Australia, um, using a chair because of post-polio syndrome, said it wonderfully when she said, God included me, others should have to justify why, why I should be excluded. And third, a new era of worship opportunities for and about people with disabilities highlights and focuses issues and themes that are not just about them, quote unquote, but really about all of us. As more and more people of faith come to understand the implications of inclusive ministries and congregational supports, and people begin to talk about the spiritual and theological, theological significance of this frontier. It happens when people begin to connect new ministries with ancient themes and images of scripture and faith, and begin to understand that what we're doing here is not something new as much as it is recovering old traditions and discovering new ways that sacred beliefs are understood yet anew and apply yet anew in ways of being the people of God at whatever level of ability or disability we have in both prayer and praise and play together. Different traditions and faith communities will have different images, but let me share here six that have been important to me uh, as I look at what's been happening. And again, these are themes that are not just about people with disabilities, but about all of us. First, congregations who are working in inclusive ministries have begun to recapture a foundation, the biblical foundation of hospitality to the stranger and receiving the guest rather than seeing their inclusive ministries as special ministries to special people. It's recovering the ancient call for hospitality to the stranger. In a so-called normal world, people with disabilities are often the prototypical stranger, even beyond the strangers of race, of sexual orientation, of creed, and or nationality. In fact, every one of those Strangers also includes people with disabilities and their families. Children and adults with disabilities often feel like strangers within their own communities, even where all other traits are shared. Faith communities are recovering the call to welcome the stranger as a core tradition of Jewish, Islamic, and Christian faiths. In the Bible, that call is not ultimately about what the host does for the stranger, but how the stranger, over and over again, brings the presence and spirit of God to the host. Parker Palmer, a writer and teacher who many of you know, whose books about spirituality, education, and community, cited this call to hospitality as a fundamental building block of community in a conference entitled Merging Two Worlds that I helped coordinate in Rochester in the late 1980s. He noted that there are several reasons why a biblical faith calls us to welcome the stranger in addition to the awareness that the stranger often bore gifts from God. First, if the world or my congregation is not safe for strangers, then it's not safe for me, for I am always a stranger, or could be, to someone else. This comes straight out of the desert religious traditions, where moving from Water hole to water hole or camping or site to site was a matter of life and death, and being welcomed where people had water and food was being was literally a matter of life and death. Second, strangers save us from a fundamental danger of modern life, Parker says, and that's being the same, pretending that we're all homogenous and that we all are like us. Being all the same, he says, is really, really boring. Or sometimes when we think we're all the same, we are really, of course, just hiding all kinds of differences that we have, both in community and congregational life. And third, there's a recognition that there's both diversity 
and unity at the very heart of creation, a diversity, a hidden wholeness that we need to celebrate and to enjoy. Parker quotes Thomas Merton about the hidden wholeness in, that, in, that, in his talk there and in other writings. He also quoted Ken Paget, a poet who said, any God who creates Eskimos and elephants must have had two or three kids of his own. So the question is often now how congregations are not just welcoming people with disabilities, but it leads to how are we welcoming anyone who is a stranger? The secular word for hospitality is accommodation. And the question becomes, how do we accommodate and be hospitable and receive the guest in faith communities? The second theme is remembering the body. Remembering the body, first of all, means pulling back into our theological awareness, an awareness that the body is uh, an important uh, part of reflection and discernment, uh, not just the mind or the spirit. The body is incarnational. It's a remembering that all of us are embodied, that we all, that there is a kind of incarnational messiness of all of our lives, and how do we deal with that in our theological understandings? But secondly, it also is a re hyphen membering. Remembering that people who have been excluded can now be included to be members again. That what faith communities are doing is remembering people, helping them to become members. A young teenager at a synagogue in New Jersey gave a youth day sermon on the same day that several adults with multiple disabilities from a nearby developmental center were celebrating their bar and bar mitzvahs. His task, and I felt for him, was to speak from the readings of the day, the boring parts of numbers that simply recite the census of the various tribes of Israel. Then he made the wonderful connection in his talk that what the synagogue was doing that day was making the point that these adults with disabilities were being counted again as one of us. They were being counted in. The title of a book written by two young adults by, with Down syndrome, Jason Kingsley and Michael Levitz. Count us in, not out. Or when a child or adults with a disability participates like any other child or adult in the rites or rituals of transition to adulthood and membership, such as baptism, confirmation, first Eucharist, bar and bar mitzvahs, etc. They are being membered or remembered if they did not have the chance before. When people with disabilities are invited to join as full members and not just attend, they are being remembered as part of the people of faith. One of my early teachers in that was a woman named Tilly Giamento, a mom who was Catholic who came to an early meeting at a new religious studies program we were helping to establish at a developmental center in Rochester, New York. And she asked why her son could not receive First Communion. She had, he had been ref refused First Communion and Confirmation a number of years ago, and she wondered why that could not happen. There was a young Catholic seminary student with me, and he and I both said, well, we think it can. Let's see what happens. And sure enough, because of, recept of a receptive and hospitable bishop, a couple of months later, her son Michael and five or six other people were uh, received First Communion and Confirmation in an inclusive uh, service at that developmental center. She later said to a Catholic sister who was visiting, you know, when the church rejected my son, they rejected me. And when they accepted my son, they accepted me and all of our family. In theological terms, when a person or people are saved from isolation, from being oppressed or enchained by stigma and environment, or from being seen as a person with no gifts or rights or outcast, to being a contributor, a member, then there's an ancient word for that kind of remembering. It's called redemption. Redemption. 
And if it's about moving past wounded, wounding experiences that a person or a family might have had in the past with their clergy or congregation, to a new kind of effort to include, then there's and help people be real members. There's an ancient name for that kind of remembering that includes forgiveness and re reconnection, and that's reconciliation. Cal Montgomery, a young woman with autism, has written a wonderful essay in which she said that in most of her early life, she heard the words, the kingdom of God is open to all with a preposition, except, and that except included me, until she found an Episcopal church that welcomed her so thoroughly that that except disappeared from her celebration of being part of the kingdom of God. Reconciliation, tikkum olam, repairing the breach. The third thing is restoring the sanctuary. When people are remembered and are able to be come in again, either because of architectural accommodations, but more importantly, attitudinal issues and welcome, then when that child or adult with their disability or anyone finds a safe place in their congregation, that is another way of restoring a sense of sanctuary. It's not just about the ramps and where you put the pew cups, pew cuts, and other kinds of accessibility, but do you feel safe there? Can you be just who you are? Where's the place for you to come with all of your gifts and needs, strengths and weaknesses, abilities and vulnerabilities, to be known and loved just as I am? An experience that for many of us, at least in the Baptist tradition, we sing about by the words amazing grace and the huge importance of being accepted and valued for what you bring. The opposite of that is a story that ha has haunted me for two decades and fueled a lot of the work that I try to do. I was at a conference in South Carolina and asked some families at a Down Syndrome conference to tell me your church stories. A number told some wonderful stories, like the mother who talked about taking her pastor with her to her child's IEP meeting in the local school system. And those are meetings, of course, where a parent with many other professionals often feels powerless or uh, lacking a lot of, of input when you're talking with an array of professionals. And the, she said it was wonderful. We got everything we wanted. And then she said they thought he was our lawyer. A, a story that brings down the house usually, but turn it around, just think about the potential power of clergy going with congregational members to somebody's IEP or their person-centered planning meeting. And think about what professionals would feel if they knew a family or person was rep had a whole congregation sort of behind them and willing to help as well. But, the but at this conference in South Carolina, a mother came up to me after the break and said, I couldn't get up and say this because it's still too raw and too, still too fresh. We've just moved here from, South, from Pennsylvania, and it could have been any other state where this happened. And in Pennsylvania, our daughter, who's labeled microcephalic and moderately retarded uh, in those old labels, uh, had a job, a supported employment job at, at McDonald's. She wore a uniform to work and had a real sense of pride every day as she was part of that workforce and team. They moved to South Carolina. There was no supported employment program, and the daughter ended up back in a sheltered workshop where there were 50 or 60 other adults with different kinds of disabilities. They started looking for a church home, church shopping, and tried a number of different congregations. And one night tried one where I think they worked on having the, their daughter be part of a youth group, but there had not been any preparation done or the congregation at that point was not thinking about ways to include 
uh, people with disabilities. Something happened, and the mother never found out the details, but she said when we got home, her daughter that night said, no church, Mom, no church, no more church. And she said, I got into being a mom and saying, we've got to go to church. We're part of God's family. It's God's house. We belong there. We need a church home. Whereupon that young, microcephalic, moderately retarded daughter said, in words that cut straight to the heart, well, it may be God's house, but he's not home. It may be God's house, but he's not home. For so many people with disabilities and their families, that safe place, the sanctuary, has not been their church or temple or synagogue. A place is not safe if you can't get into it, but more importantly, it's not safe if the stigma or attitudes or prejudices or fears about you follow you from the world out there into the world in here, in our life as the people of God, into the religious sanctuary. It's especially true, I think, for people with mental illness and their families. When those stigmas or fears are given divine powers, or such as, what did you do that God sent you this disability, or disability is seen as a lack of faith, then it's even less safe. In a story from Pennsylvania a number of years ago, a mom sent me an email saying she was trying to get her, help her congregation to understand that her son with Down syndrome wanted to be baptized. The pastor misunderstood that desire and thwarted it with a statement that he doesn't really need to be baptized, he's already there. And that's a version of theology, in a sense, from the past, a kind of understanding that people with Down syndrome or other disabilities were kind of holy innocents, or people who didn't have to worry about being responsible or making a decision. That kind of attitude is inclusive, but it doesn't give people the chance to show what they do believe and to participate and to learn as much as they possibly can. He, the mother didn't give up and brought some other resources and stories to her congregation. And finally, she told me later that they had a baptismal service, but it wasn't on the, at the usual Sunday morning hour, but a private service that included family and friends. The tragedy of that service was that as he emerged from the baptismal pool, somebody pointed to the ring that was around the pool where the water had risen and then subsided and said, look at that. And that young man with Down syndrome said in the best of Baptist theology, yes, that's my sin. The tragedy is not that he didn't, he did get baptized. The tragedy or the loss was that the whole congregation did not get to hear him say that on Sunday morning with everybody, where everybody was there. In the books of the Torah and the biblical tradition, claiming sanctuary was a freedom in, available in designated towns to help those who felt they were being unjustly accused or pursued. As congregations help their worship space and their life together to be as welcoming and accessible as possible, then the role of sanctuary really gets restored, not just for people with disabilities, but for everyone. A pastor told me that the first Sunday he mentioned concern for relatives and friends with mental illness in their families in our lives in his pastoral prayer said, the next day my phone did not stop ringing because people in my church now knew it was okay that they had permission to call me and talk about issues related to mental illness in their own families or their own personal issues. Restoring Sanctuary. Fourth, when we restore the sanctuary <clears throat> and the person or a family knows it and feels it, it's like the words of a song by a friend of mine, Tom Hunter, 
where the verse goes something like, it's awesome to be surrounded by people who are not sorry for what you cannot do. It's awesome to be surrounded by people who are not sorry for what you cannot do. Tom wrote this song after hearing those words from one of the daughters of Rudd and Ann Turnbull as they were coming out of a, a circle of support or a group action group that was around their son Jay. Friends and, and professionals working together to figure out the best ways to support and include Jay, their son. And when Jay's sister walked out of there saying, God, it's just awesome to be surrounded by people who are not sorry for what you cannot do. Think about what would happen if that attitude extended to our faith communities and people with disabilities came and people saw them first as just purely welcome, but then secondly, as people who were looking at them not for their deficits, at their deficits or limits, but what the gifts and the strengths of the person who's coming. When we look at people, children and adults on the basis of gifts and strengths, not just on their needs, then a congregation's beginning to practice what's called the best of person-centered planning, or what John McKnight and John Kretschmann uh, call capacity vision, and the whole world of community building and asset-based community development. It's really the shared interest, abilities, skills, and strengths that connect us. Any community, congregation or community, or state or nation that focuses simply primarily on the glass being half empty rather than looking at the glass as half full is not going to go very far if the focus is simply on deficits, but rather looks at the gifts and strengths that every single person and every community has. Congregations who've been welcoming and inclusive often come to the point of saying, we're not doing so much for them, they're doing a lot for us. Sometimes it's just simply the gift of presence and the gift of personality that comes with children and adults with disabilities. But other times, that's because they've begun to move beyond and figure out ways for people with disabilities to use their gifts and interests or to connect people with disabilities with other members of the congregation, not because a member of the congregation wants to be a support to a person with a disability on the first hand, but because those two people share some other kind of interest or gift or strength. Maybe they're Yankee fans or Jets fans, or maybe there are Braves fans or like to fish or lighten certain kinds of music. We can always find those kinds of interests and gifts that connect people when other assumptions or stigmas or labels get in the way of seeing each other as real human beings. And people in congregations then get to give and link up with others out of something they feel really good about and passionate about, which gets around the kinds of issues of what do I do, how do I talk with a person with a disability. Many Catholic families have shared with me a paradigm of all this when they talk about the gift of their being able to, with their child to bring down the gifts or to bring down the elements for communion uh, and for the Lord's Supper, for Mass, uh, to be celebrated, to bring the gifts to the altar and how important that feels to them to be bearers of gifts uh, in that service. When we see gifts in everyone, Think of the story of the widow's mite. There's no gift that a congregation really does not need, nor should, should be able to find a place to use if we put our imagination to work. And a gift given at whatever level is a gift of, it can be a story about faith as a whole. And if we look at those gifts, and ways that then people can put them to use in service to others, then that illustrates the fifth theme that I think um, is part of this new kind of wave of ministries and inclusive ministries.
and that's reversing the call. The importance of capacity vision and celebrating gifts means that the real question for people of faith is not how so-called typical or normal people are called to welcome and include people with disabilities, but how all of us, people with disabilities included, are called to respond to our understanding of God's call and love in each of our lives as an individual and as a member of the people of faith. How does each person respond to the obligations of mitzvah, the call to discipleship, the practice of the five laws, or however call is understood in a particular religious tradition that one embraces and or one that is in which you are feeling embraced? A woman named Kathy McDonald was my first teacher on this many, many years ago at one of the first ever conferences on inclusive congregations that I helped organize. She got up and told her story about being sent from to a large institution, old state institution, where I was a chaplain for about three years because of her cerebral palsy. She was perfectly capable uh, intellectually, but her cerebral palsy made her speech and gait uh, really problematic. She was sent there because that was what people did in those days. That was the best advice of many a professional and many a health care uh, organization. But she then got to leave, uh, moved out in some of the first wave to go out to group homes back in Rochester, and then to her own apartment. And she ended up with the kind of call to all of us at that conference that day, you know, she said in her shaky voice, you know, it's really important for you to be nice to handicapped people, but it's more important for you to let them be nice to you. It's real important for you to be nice to handicapped people, but it's more important for you to let them be nice to you. In the, in the Christian tradition, a statement is often made that it's more blessed to give than receive. If most of us are honest, it's also easier. People of faith are taught to be givers, to be helpers, contributors, stewards, committee members, followers, disciples, board members, you name it. It's harder for everyone to admit our wants or to reveal our needs the places where we would like to receive. When children or adults with disabilities are seen as only consumers, as the name so often happens, or by the, which they're often called in our society these days, consumers, that really is seeing them as making them into designated receivers, quote unquote, the ones, the only ones who really need and don't have gifts to give then that really is something that uh, is a real a burden for them, I think. People with disabilities and their families will tell you about the gift of being welcomed and received. But when we allow everyone the dignity and the right and the responsibility to give to others out of their own sense of call, think about what that means in terms of inclusion and welcome and helping everyone being perceived as a contributor. And in fact, that kind of gift giving can be a way of supporting a whole family. If a person with a disability is invited to be an usher or help somewhere, a parent then may get to go to be part of the choir or part of an adult ed class. There's a wonderful story in a new book by Chuck Colson's daughter, Dancing with Max. Uh, her son Max has got autism and they had been um, sort of kept out of church or faith communities by Max's autism and people's attitudes toward it for a number of years until she <clears throat> as a parent and family could no longer stand it and they started using as some people are doing these days kind of the best of applied behavioral analysis strategies and techniques to help Max learn about how to sit in a service starting first with coming near the very end 
and then leaving and then continuing to go earlier and earlier till an individual is able to sit through a whole service. So you don't start at the beginning of the service and then get up and have to leave. But on one of the first Sundays she came, as they were leaving, as the church was disbanding, there was a group of men who were called in that congregation the Grunt Crew who stacked the chairs and put up the chairs. And they said to Max, you want to help? You want to help? And that moment transformed uh, Max's and their family's experience with the congregation and their community of faith. Max became a regular member of the Gunt Crew. People saw him contributing, and then people figured out ways to help him be included in other parts of the life of that congregation. Think of the loss to everyone involved. If this story had not happened on the Jersey Shore, a young man with Down syndrome was invited and trained to be a church usher in his Catholic parish. And on one of the first Saturday afternoons when he is serving, when he is the acolyte at the Mass or, or, and being an usher, who comes but an older couple who came that afternoon, um, came that afternoon, and later after the service, the young man's son went looking, the young man's mother, sorry, went looking for her son. She couldn't find him. Here's a connection with ancient biblical story. Young mother seeks young son in temple. There's a real connection there. And she finally found him talking to this older couple. And it turned out that they had come to Mass that afternoon with spirits downtrodden, <clears throat> with uncertainty, with a lot of anxiety and fear, because their first grandchild had just been born that week with Down syndrome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Think of the power of what that felt like to them to walk in and to see a young adult as a contributing, participating member of that parish and of that congregational community. And it, it appeared as if they had sought him out after the service to learn more about him and his life and his faith. Think of what it meant to them to be a, to think of what it meant to him to be a greeter and for them to be greeted um, on that morning when so many questions were, were reverberating in their life and soul. And if you haven't seen the uh, documentary Praying with Lior about Lior and his bar bar mitzvah and the gifts that he brings to his community of faith. Uh, there's no other better documentary or film that captures the ways in which a person with a developmental disability can be seen for his gifts and the way he contributes to the life of a community of faith. And finally, the sixth kind of area of focus or theme that has emerged for me as we work with and include people with all different kinds of disabilities. As congregations practice inclusion with many forms of sensory and motor impairments with different kinds of disabilities, then what happens? Congregations learn new forms of communication and connection that help everybody to move beyond our usual language the usual spoken, heard, and read word, which helps literally everyone recover our senses of feeling, our sounds of movement, of taste, and of touch. Recovering our senses. Recovering our senses. As people with intellectual disabilities are included in worship, you'll hear stories about ways that those services need to become more spontaneous with places for simplicity and spontaneity. Who enjoys that? Usually everyone. And when a pastor learns that asking a rhetorical question can sometimes get an immediate answer, it may be a question or an answer in return that many others in the congregation wished they had said. 
as congregations make their sanctuaries accessible and welcoming, who comes back? Sometimes it's older people or others that have been so-called shut-ins, quote-unquote, but may have in fact been shut out by barriers of attitude and architecture. Rabbi Dan Grossman at Temple Adith Israel in Lawrenceville, New Jersey, tells the story of how their new building, built to be as accessible as possible, enabled a older woman, 90 plus years, to come back to the services at least once a month. She could not get into the old building. When she died, the family was able to have the funeral at the new sanctuary with friends and extended relatives and congregational members. And it turned out that that woman and her husband had kept the synagogue alive, kept the old building going during the Depression by paying the mortgage. Think of the huge value and symbolism and importance of being able to help people who've been pillars of your faith community, not just because of funds, but because of their actions and services and gifts, so that they can be included into the days when disability happens to them, as it will for most of us. When a congregation uses a sign language interpreter, or does other things like those suggested by Peggy Johnson to help congregations be inclusive of people with, who are deaf or people with hearing impairments, signing in congregations and le- seems to me like a form of liturgical dance that you'll see many so-called typical people watching just as much as a person who is deaf does. I get fascinated by trying to figure out how that sign embodies the words that were just said and how it relates and connects together. A simple movement version of the Lord's Prayer, not a signed version, but a movement version that I've used for years in services with people with intellectual disabilities, has become even more profound for me as I've shared that with kids and with congregations and we together in a worship service move through the Lord's Prayer first with words and then secondly have everyone move through the Lord's Prayer with no words being spoken but praying that prayer with our bodies. There are others who put Psalms to movement and other places in the Bible. In the Bible. Um, In a new era of technology, think of the ways that phone lines and computers and networking devices and video screens and others are all used to help people see and hear and participate in services, even people who may be truly shut in by an illness or disability. Some congregations have put phone lines right into the pulpit so that people could call in and listen and participate in the service as it's going on. Or think about ways that when you've got children or adults with behavioral kinds of issues, when you use really good behavioral strategies to help those children learn how to participate, what's called positive behavioral supports. And when that gets done in Sunday schools and also in services, but in Sunday schools in particular, Think of those strategies that help children with challenging behaviors become part of a Sunday school or part of the faith community are also strategies that are good for any kid Um, because children with disabilities are not the only ones that maybe act out when they're bored or don't understand or have something else going on that their behavior becomes the only form of communication Um, they know. A congregation can learn to include people with visual impairments. Then we we are challenged, as all of us, to recover our sense of touch and the simple power or our invitation to use a guiding hand or an elbow or learn how to say courteously to a person who's blind to say your name if you're nearby to ask if they need any assistance, or also to say when you're leaving so that they are not left talking in in midair. 
As readers, hopefully you can cite more examples. But the possibility is that the use of color and taste and touch and sights and sounds and symbols and actions that speak beyond words can help communal worship and education and life to become even more alive. When a sanctuary is really safe and all feelings are welcome, and even the scars and stigma of emotional and psychological illness can be addressed and soothed, then you really know that there's a potential for growth that occurs because a community's confidence grows that it can indeed embrace and sustain many forms of disability, both visible and invisible. As my a friend of mine, uh, Sue Montgomery in Western Pennsylvania says, and Sue uses a wheelchair, um, is on the board at uh, the Presbyter Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and, and clergy herself. She says she often uses the metaphor and image of a family because all of us, most of us, call ourselves a church or a synagogue family. And when people in and communities of faith say we don't have the training or the understanding to help a person be included in our in our faith community. And she notes that, well, parents who have kids with disabilities born into their lives or diagnosed haven't had any training either. And what does a family do? It figures it out. It gets help. It gets the things that are needed to done as you encounter or deal with new situations, new issues, or problems to help someone's growth um, be as, as full as it can possibly be. So if we say we're a church family, then our response should be, we can figure this out. You're welcome here. And by golly, we might end up learning a lot as well. So it's really about all of us, from hospitality to remembering to restoring sanctuary, to celebration, to reversing the call, to recovering the census. A new era of worship opportunities is made possible by inclusive and accessible congregations that's not just about children and adults with disabilities and their families, but about all, but about all of us. The stories are not just about disability, but in fact those stories become modern parables for faith communities and traditions in which everyone lives. Think about the parables in the Bible um, or stories in, the, in the, uh, the Hebrew Bible. Many of those are about people who are marginalized becoming, being welcomed or included or accepted. And those stories become parables about what life and faith as people of God are all about. If congregations truly are be becoming communities of faith and worship where everyone's presence is welcomed and wanted, where pain is received, where strengths are sustained, where gifts are called forth and used, and our vulnerabilities are not seen as a sign of sin, but a reminder of the gift of grace that can work through all of God's people, as Tom Reynolds so wonderfully describes in his book, Vulnerable Communion, then there really is a new era to celebrate for all of us, all of us, as limited, striving, gifted people in the life of the people of God. Thank you.